only missing detail was that he doesn't have a life. Uh, so, <laughs> so let's see if we can uh, uh, put the uh, slides on. Please. Um, as you can tell, the title has changed slightly, uh, and that's because it's work in progress. Um, the second thing that uh, I need to confess is that I thought this was the right opportunity to use the Info uh, Metrics uh, Institute as a sort of therapy group, because I have a lot of pain to share, and this must be the right place where to have other people sharing their pain. So if for the next half an hour you feel like Oh, this is painful. I just achieved my goal because I would like you to feel that pain. Now, to feel that pain, uh, you need to be ready <laughs> to um, sort of be astonished, uh, I hope, uh, by something very simple. So that's the second warning. Uh, if you feel pain, that's okay. If you feel that what I'm talking about is way too simple, that's okay too. It's the kind of pain that you feel when you, you know, hammer your finger. It's simple and it's painful. So uh, the next slides uh, are the hammer and uh, I hope you will provide the finger. So um, some of you um, have in the past uh, discussed, not just with me, uh, whether information should or should not be considered uh, truthful in and of itself. Just forget about that for a moment. Just consider that for the next half an hour or so, whatever information we're talking about is true information. If you are like me, you find that utterly redundant. If you are like other people, you like to be told that it has to be true. Whatever it is, whichever side you like to sit on, just consider that whatever information we're talking about, it's true. It's just the way the world is. Hmm? And make it simple. No Kantian, no skepticism, no get here, no nothing. That's the way your mom understands you know, information when you tell mom, mom, that's the way it is, okay. So that's the first warning. So with that in the background, well suppose Alice, and that's what Microsoft provides when you ask about Alice. Um, suppose that Alice uh, knows that something is the case, hmm? that P. And because she has these two sort of qualifications, She's informed that P, in other words, she holds that piece of information. And again, if you like to be told that that's true, that's okay, so she holds that true uh, bit of information. And she can provide some kind of account on that. And we can spend the rest of the week discussing what that account means, justification, explanation, warrant, you name it, I'm not interested. Whatever it is that satisfies your no, particular needs on their side, just put it there. So suppose that that's okay. Just you don't have to agree with me. You just have to be on the same page. Hmm? So suppose that that's the case. She has the information and she can uh, say, uh, answer questions about it. Now, that's the pain I feel. What happens when uh, Alice is also responsible for the way things are, for the way the system happened to be? No. P is about system S, and actually Alice put the system in that particular state. Now there are lots of examples here. Alice could be God. Mm -hmm. She says so, it is so. Mm -hmm. She could be Conan Doyle. She writes that Sherlock Holmes never visited Rome, therefore Sherlock Holmes never visited Rome. She is the one who actually puts the sugar in Bob's coffee. If she knows that because she put it there. Many examples. She's the one who baptized Bob. No, she knows that Bob's name is Bob because that's the way she did it. No, she said this child is being. No, it's going to be called Bob. So all these are cases in which the system S is uh, modeled by P, and well, she knows that because no, she made it so. So what's the information analysis of this maker's knowledge? This is where the value starts kicking in. Uh, it will be clear in the following uh, few minutes, but basically is 
what's the value of some kind of information when the, you have different agents in front of you? And one of them is Alice, the maker of that information, but other people, other agents, are not in the same position. That's why it, it gets a little bit more complicated, but not much. This is just um, uh, a, a sort of a, a fancy way of saying something elementary, as I show you in the next slide. So we have a particular system that change uh, states, call that you know, transition states. Transition is useful, so then we can get a T for that. Alice is the maker, is the one who actually makes the transition happening. So she's the agent A that changes S. There's a change in the system, call it T, you know, just moving from S1 to S2, and is as elementary as it looks. There's a message, which is not a transition. The transition is moving this watch from here to here. The message is, I'll tell you that, etc. So the message is the message M that P, whatever P conveys, namely that T, the change, has occurred. Then this Bob, and Bob is you now the gentleman in the middle, uh, is the observer. He actually sees that happening. He's not making things happening, he's actually sees things happening. He's the one who observes T. And then there's a third person, Carol. And again, all Microsoft icons anyway. And she's the agent to whom Bob communicates their P through their particular message. Now, because this is a little bit complicated, let's have a game. The game has to be chess, especially if your dad doesn't do anything else but play chess like mine. So we have a system, which is a chess game. Uh, Alice uh, plays white. The move is king's pawn move two steps, mind. I have to use English to do that, but that's not what the move is. The move is like, shk, okay? She takes the pawn and moves. Then there's a message saying in English notation, that's what it's called, E2, E4. Then there's P, the particular information that, no, the move that you actually get through that particular sort of message, E2, E4. This, uh, no, uh, Bob, let's say, is the guy who plays black, and C is Carol, the receiver of the message. She is in a different room, or she's blind. So here's the problem that I have, and that's the, I hope you feel at the same time the pain and the simplicity. Alice just moved the poem. She's the maker. So she has information about T, the particular move. Hmm? And she has an account for that particular move. Maybe she has a particular strategy in mind. Maybe she wants to let Bob win because Bob is her son. Maybe she doesn't know better. That's the only move that she can thought of. Whatever account she can provide, whatever justification, explanation, etc., she has it. Just that's the condition that we have accepted. So what's the difference between her information, her knowledge, one, two, and the knowledge that Bob has and Carol has? So what I'm suggesting in the following slides is that I'm going to defend the view that is actually two, that she has a different account for that move and not entirely one. Now, this is where things are getting messy because I'm not completely sure and I will share with you my doubts. One way of not doing this, and I'll take it away, is to say, for example, in terms of, uh, or the difference between Alice, Bob, and Carol is that she has a different kind of knowledge, a different kind of information, because hair is know-how. No, it isn't. It's not that she knows about that particular move because she has a particular skill and ability. It's not like riding a bicycle. Hmm? So I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not going to say, well, the difference between the three people here, the three agents, in terms of value of that information, is because she has know-how, the other two don't have it. If Bob were in the same position, he, he would have the same know-how, for example. So um, how do we distinguish and take away Carol in the first place? Well, suppose, as I said, Carol is blind, or is you know, more likely and nicely, she's in a different room. We broadcast the, the game. Uh, at a certain point, Alice makes a move, and the big announcement goes out. And the logicians among us know what is happening here. No? It's a public announcement. So, E2, E4, in the other room as well. Now, A and B and C 
they get their message simultaneously through you know, the announcement. I hope, that's at least I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to be proved wrong, but I think that announcement is the same for everybody, so that's the same information that they get, at least in terms of announcement. So it's not that that makes a difference. However, A and B cannot be informed by that announcement. A, because she made the move, and B, because saw the move happening. The person who actually is informed, because he didn't have the information before, is Carol. So M is informative only for C. For Carol, who is in the other room, hears the message, she didn't see it, she didn't make the move. So we know that that's what Carol is actually like. So as A, Alice making, and B, experiencing the actual move, are different from and informationally more similar than among themselves. Carol's receiving the message that E to E4. So I'll try to, as it were, cut that particular branch away. I like to stay on the main uh, track, the difference between Alice and Bob. If you think that this is not enough, well, uh, we have time for uh, question and answers later. But I suppose that this is at least the beginning of a strategy to make sure that Carol doesn't mess around with our picture. Remember, we want to understand Alice. Now, if Bob is informed about T, but because he just saw Alice making the move, then the perceptual conditions, whatever it is, uh, maybe they're you know, playing a uh, you know, sound game or a braille game, other con context, doesn't have to be visual, but whatever perceptual conditions that make Bob informed, in this case, reliable vision, are different from the poetic, as in Greek, making conditions that make the message E2, E4 true. You have a message, something makes that message true. The conditions that make that message true is actually Alice making the move. It's not seeing the move happening. So the sender of the message, remember that's Bob, Bob not telling, say, Carol that the move had been made, cannot really be informed by the message. If you are the messaging, well, when, once that message comes back to you, that message so surely doesn't inform you. It is meant to inform uh, the receiver. So this is, in a way, an anti-idealist uh, conclusion. Perceiving something does not make that something to be the case. Bob's information is the sender's information. And that's why any message that comes back to him in terms of that particular uh, move is not make, uh, gonna make much of a difference. I mean, I think so far, you shouldn't feel too much pain because that's, that seems to me quite okay. I mean, it's, a, it's more like cleaning, cleaning the table from uh, the, the, the messy bits. Now, if Alice now is informed about that particular move, as we think she is, she just made it, uh, think of uh, Alice putting sugar in Bob's coffee, etc. then the experiential conditions, you know, the fact that she did that, that make Alice informed, are the same making conditions. The experience that she has, is the same, very same thing that makes that move happening. And that makes E2, E4 true. Now, she is, at this point, the source of the message, the very initial sort of uh, element that make M uh, happen. And a source of a message cannot be informed by the message. So this is a more of a constructionist conclusion. For yes, is making, doing, and making true the alertization of that process are two sides of the same coin. Uh, you make something happening and you make you know, whatever the information about that something happening true. Alice is the source information. Her account of T, however, is different from Bob's. In what way? And now it's going to get um, for the philosophers above all. I hope uh, uh, simply painful. Uh, I grew up with that sort of uh, um, with those, those three distinctions as a kind of a first chapter in your philosophy Bible. Not because they're not questionable, but because that's the way you speak. You, know, you may be speaking rubbish, but that's the way, you know, in a philosophy department, you talk about knowledge slash information. Is it synthetic? Is it analytic? Is it necessary? Is it contingent? Is it a priori? Is it a posteriori? So I think that's what we need to do. I mean, in terms of understanding the value of information for um, Alice is to go back to you know, the uh, first year undergraduate level uh, 
introduction to epistemology or uh, philosophical logic and wonder what kind of knowledge are we talking about here? If Alice knows that that's what's happening, that move, and there's a difference between Alice knowing because she made the move versus Bob knowing because she saw the move happening. Remember the difference between this child is going to be called uh, Cicero versus how do you know that that child is called Cicero? And anyone who has read any Kripke knows where I'm going. Well, these are the categories that should help. They should help. But they don't quite help, and that's the painful bit. So Alice's information about T, she, remember, she's, she's the one who actually moved the poem. I mean, it has to be synthetic. It can't be analytic. And for the, um, for the non-philosophers, that means that she's actually, the, the, the piece of information puts things together no, empirically in a way that is not simply dependent, and I know it's more complicated, but allow me, it's not simply dependent on, say, the words. It's not just that Alice knows that a triangle has three sides because that's what triangle means. It's not just because you know, bachelors are unmarried because if you know your English, well, that's the way we use bachelor. No, she now knows that the poem has moved from E2 to E4, and that has to be something synthetic, something that you put together uh, by looking at the world. So it's not analytic, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy if people are happy with this. And surely it has to be contingent. It can't be the case that in all possible worlds, E2, E4, well, not least, no, because chess allows many other moves. So it is synthetic and contingent. Question is, is it a priori or a posteriori? And again, for the non-Kantian among us, does Alice have to have access to experience in order to acquire that information, a posteriori? Or could she actually reach at that piece of information? Could she actually uh, acquire that knowledge by just checking what's in their head without any appeal to experience? Well, you can see that this is easy for, for Bob. If Bob doesn't have any experience, he cannot know that E2, E4. So for Bob, that is certainly a posteriori. He has to have the experience. Is through experience that Bob learns E2, E4. But Alice, Alice is going to make the move. And if you find Alice a little bit difficult, think about Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. But you have to read that Sherlock Holmes never, say, visited Rome, never went to the Bodleian Library. You have to acquire that information a posteriori. But Conan Doyle, surely he doesn't have to check his experience. And neither does God hmm? when he says, there be light and bingo. That's better than Phillips. So the problem I have is that if you use a posteriori just as a way of saying, well, it's not a priori, I'm kind of happy. You say, well, it's, it's just an, an, a label that covers much more, but you use it just negatively. The thing is that Unfortunately, these words in, in philosophy they can mean a lot of experience. Alice acquires uh, her information through experience by doing something, but not because of that particular doing in the same sense in which Bob does. Bob does that uh, by experience, and Carol actually by proxy experience. She's not even there. She got it through testimony, again, for the epistemologist that opens a, a whole chapter in a different direction. I'll, don't worry, I'll... I have a band-aid at the end of all this pain, so uh, wait for that. But remember Alice's information about T is the source information. So we say, agree that it's synthetic and contingent. But it seems to be a posteriori in a weak sense, not in the same sense in which Bob's experience is. So it's neither a priori nor a posteriori in the ordinary Kantian way in which we discuss these things. The interesting thing, now we remember we decided that Alice knew that P because she had information that P and she could answer questions about P. She had an account, a justification, a warrant, or whatever. So in order to provide an account of T, Alice does not need to consult experience at all. It's not that she has to check why did that happen. She has that account back in her head. Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle, Alice baptizing Bob. So actually her account for making T the case comes logically before 
M being true. M is the message, the message sent by Bob to uh, Carol. So it seems to be a priori. And here is a bit of a, a way of uh, putting things together uh, before uh, I show you one way of uh, uh, tackling this. So Alice is the maker, uh, and she has the same synthetic and contingent information about T as Bob and C have, no less the move. And perhaps this is explains epistemology lack of interest in the maker's knowledge tradition. I mean, it's, it's a long tradition from Plato through Bacon, uh, Kant, but you don't find a chapter in your introduction to epistemology uh, course normally. It is unclear whether it is also a posteriori, but more on this in a moment. She has a source a priori account for the information about T, about the actual move, because she creates that particular move, and the observer and the receiver do not have that particular account. So that's perhaps uh, a strategy to make a move in the right direction. So make his knowledge maybe is a bit of a hybrid, is a posterior information plus a priori account, the a priori being a part of this making. I'm not quite sure, but I need to show you something that I hope will um, kind of start clarifying things. This poetic knowledge, this knowledge that comes by making things happening, about which then you know what's happening, I think it reshuffles those nice undergraduate understanding that I thought I had about the no, three distinctions. This is the way in which it works. I hope it's clear enough. So KA is for Kant, KR is for Kripke. Uh, I thought the K was insufficient. You can either like the top or the bottom, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, just pick up the bottom uh, table. Uh, zero means not, one, zero, uh, one means yes. So uh, take the two green lines, no? uh, the C, C for classic. We used to think that uh, something could be either analytic, uh, bachelors are unmarried, a priori, you don't have to check, uh, necessary, inevitably, that's true in all possible worlds, and is bloody uninformative. Well, thank you so much. If you know English, you don't have to be told. Hmm? What's the time? Is the same time that yesterday you know, was at this time. Brilliant. Yeah, that's, you must be a logician. So um, that's C0 or C1. Something is synthetic, something is happening in the world, a posteriori, you better check, is contingent, that's the way the world is, it could have gone differently, and is informative, yes. Wow, that's, that's the way you actually move the, the watch from here to there, and that's the way the world is. So the two Cs are basically the, the things that we used to have before Kant. And if you look at Kant, the red line, the red column, uh, Kant has this um, uh, synthetic a priori, mm, the one zero idea, and he tried very hard, especially with causality, and no, the philosophers here can't be bothered to uh, be told again and again a story that is quite old. Now Kripke came, comes up and he says, you know what, we can actually do the inverted uh, analysis. We could have the analytic a posteriori, the water is H2O, or the only thing that people in my department know about astronomy, yeah, you know, the morning star and the evening star, so are the same. It's true, it's analytically true, as in no, necessarily true, can't be otherwise, um, but it's synthetically true, as in, well, we discovered that. We discovered that a posteriori. We didn't know before, we had to check. And one day we discovered that the morning star and the evening star are the same. So that's where um, the two uh, differ, but if you look at the squared box, the bottom line, they are the same. They're both talking about something which is necessarily the case. Morning star, evening star kind of thing. And they both think that that's informative, otherwise they wouldn't be bothered. Now, back to Alice, Conan Doyle, God, the person who's actually uh, christening someone, Bob. And I think that we have, no, those are the two uh, red arrows, two alternatives here. Remember we, we said that, well, it's probably synthetic and contingent, E2, E4. New piece of information about the world, contingently so, could have been otherwise. But what is happening, and that's, that's the final sort of, uh, possibly only message I want to convey today, is when I was an undergraduate, when Kant was writing, when Kripke was writing, we thought about the agent, 
is based on the view that all this is happening with that Cartesian nice guy in front of the fire. It's a single individual. And for that individual, it doesn't matter. I mean, it could be the universal agent, humanity, you name it. But once you have Alice, Bob, and Carol, you have a multi-agent system, that piece of information in front of you has different values for the different agents. And to someone who actually made it true, surely it doesn't have the same value as someone who saw it happening, as opposed to someone who actually heard that it did happen. So in this particular case, uh, the yellow bit, one suggestion is that we go for synthetic, a posteriori, contingent, but not informative. It's not informative because that's uh, Alice's position. Well, the message surely doesn't tell her anything new about the world. She made a move. You cannot inform Conan Doyle that uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes never went to Rome because that's what he said, etc. You cannot inform God. Or we could go for the second arrow. It is synthetic, it is contingent, but it's a priori, and it is informative. Now, sorry, uh, uninformative. Now, that's, that's the a priori, a posteriori distinction that I, I like to uh, discuss at the end of this talk, or the last bit, and I'm checking that uh, we're doing okay with the time. I just came to a realize, and maybe I'm wrong, and I'm very, very happy to be proved wrong, and please, no, get me out of this pain, and I'll be delighted. I'll, I'll, I'll be grateful for any, any help. This a priori, a posteriori distinction, which we thought it was quite okay, especially because all we cared about was the a priori bit, so we never paid enough attention to the a posteriori, is not the right level of abstraction. It's not the, no, it doesn't give you enough granularity to understand this particular uh, issue is insufficiently finely grained. Through experience doesn't mean necessarily after experience. It's because you did it. Remember, Alice's case. And not just because you saw it happening. And surely I would like to have some a tool here that is a bit more uh, flexible. So one thing that uh, we could try to do is to wonder, just uh, sorry, to wonder about the, and I, I borrowed this from the logicians, the reality of that particular information, as in a priority or a posteriority, forget the first half, just the reality of that information for whom? In other words, how do you acquire that information? What's the reality of your piece of information? And if you are a Kantian, you have that dichotomy in mind, a, a priori or a posteriori. If you're Kripke, you have that dichotomy in mind. But if you follow what I've said, you should find that dichotomy unsatisfactory. So uh, I think we need, and I'm addressing probably uh, some bits of the right crowd, I think we need a third value here. We need something in between. I suggest anteriority as a possibility just in case you wanted to have the right word. So this synthetic E2, E4, but uninformative for Alice uh, piece of information, defines information that P, no, that particular uh, item, for the maker of the move to which P uh, refers, is a kind of a criterion to identify who Alice is. Suppose we mix people in the room and say, no, tell me who Alice is here. Well, Alice is whoever has reority of her information such that is anteriority is neither a priori nor a posteriori. Her information is something that happens to be there in her head, not because she acquired by, you know, like, bo like Bog by seeing, for example, that something happened, but because she made it happen. So neither Alice nor Bob can be informed by the message, remember, shouting, public announcement, M, no, sorry, E2, E4. And this is consistent with uh, the analysis of perception in which the mutual information between the state of the system and mutual information as in the technical mutual information, between the state of the system, the pawn being moved, and the information about that state, either Alice or Bob's, she made it, he saw it, is one. The mutual information between Alice knowing that E2, E4, N, the thing being E2, E4. 
there's no discrepancy. Alice need not be informed about the fact that she's informed about him. Then again, this is for the logician among us. There are lots of things about which we don't have that piece of information in our head just because we did whatever made that information true. Unless someone says, oh, maybe I can tell you that you have that piece of information in your head, you know, the Socratic idea. And if you find that, again, uh, unintuitive, think of a computer holding a piece of information because it actually you know, operated an arm that made the move. That computer doesn't have to have also the information that it has, that information. Hmm? Are you with me? A robot makes a particular move and therefore has the information that that move has been made. and can upgrade its state, but it doesn't have to have the information that it has the information, etc. So this takes care in sort of a model logic context of the so-called II thesis, also known as S4, K3, KK, basically uh, box phi uh, implies box box phi. And that's consistent with another story uh, which many of you may have no interest in, uh, where I try to convince people that uh, a particular model logic called B uh, is a good logic to make sense of being informed. Now the message M can work as a trigger for both A and B to make possible bot box phi. So if I make a move and I receive, remember, I know it's getting a little bit complicated, we're almost there, so give me another five minutes. Alice makes the move. She doesn't have to have the information that he ha she has the information. But then the message is announced and now she has the information that she has the information. That can trigger her as it were allow me self-conscious sort of uh, attitude towards her information. But that's a different story. Again, this is consistent with something else I've argued in a sort of double channel explanation of the uh, II thesis. Conclusion uh, in more uh, general terms, uh, and I then hope there will be some questions um, and, and answers. If you find all this a bit confusing, um, it, I think it's natural, and I, I shared the, I said the same pain. Now, in ethics, and we just uh, heard uh, uh, Jim uh, discussing some interesting issues, we, turn, we tend to uh, look uh, at Alice, the, the source, the agent, the one who makes the move. And you, know, you pick up your introduction to ethics, and it's all about Alice. Now, most of my work has been in favor of Bob, hmm? the black player the guy who actually receives the move. Now, if you think that that's odd and strange, think of environmental ethics, medical ethics, um, ethics which take the patient as central to the ethical discourse. It's not what should I do, but rather what should be done or should not be done to him. Hmm? So in ethics, I try to show that uh, we should put uh, a lot of emphasis on the receiver of action or message rather than on the source. We have disregarded that corner. But in epistemology, I've tried to do exactly the opposite. And that's why some people find it uh, abrasive. But it's not meant to be, it's just, I realized this later in life. I understood why you know, everybody was driving in the opposite direction though, and that's, uh, that's interesting. So I tried to show that you know, standard approaches in epistemology, in philosophical logic, they're very much concerned with Bob. Bob who looks at the game. Now we've been looking at the game since Plato, uh, since we were in the cave. You, you watch and watch and uh, you visualize and ideas and of course comes from Eidos. So we have a whole visual approach to epistemology, etc. And you are astonished to know that you can drive and find fake barns uh, on your way because you, you thought they were real barns but they're not real barns, etc. I mean, the epistemologists will understand the references. So it's all about getting the information and wondering what's happening to all this getting. Again, Descartes comes to mind. But actually, I mean, especially in these days when you're actually producing and making and you know, pouring out so much information, I think it's time to look at Alice, the maker. She's the one who's actually you know, providing that information, constructing it and so on. And she has, contrary to what Plato argued in the past, Certainly a different 
and perhaps, I will say, a better knowledge of that piece of information, as opposed to Bob, let alone Carol. Carol, who receives the message from Bob, who saw things happening, while Alice was actually the one who was making things happening in the first place. So, to simplify, and that's the final message of uh, this uh, uh, talk, is in epistemology, you should actually be concerned much more about Bob, and in, uh, sorry, in ethics, and in epistemology, we should really look at uh, what Alice is up to, uh, because she's full of tricks. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that that, that is um, a, a serious difficulty. Um, in other words, how does she really acquire the information that the move, for example, has been made? Maybe she's dreaming, or maybe she tried, but uh, maybe she misunderstands chess or whatever. Um, that's why I make it conditional on, suppose that she actually acquired that information. Now, the acquisition of the information, I agree with you, it has to involve experience. I mean, unless the experience, the actual moving of the poem is there done, done successfully, she cannot have the information that she pretends to have. But it will be, the thing is not, that, that, that I believe that's the important step, is to compare this to what happens to Bob. So it's not just, well, she needs an experience, therefore is a posteriori. Because the kind of experience that she needs is different from the kind of experience that Bob has. Bob has the experience of seeing something happen. It's a perceptual, not passive, or whatever you want to call it. In her case, Suppose we have the message, E2, E4. Bob would have to have some kind of perceptual, epistemological access to the system in order to know that. She would simply look at you and say, I know, I made it. Like, someone walks into the kitchen and Alice puts sugar in Bob's coffee. Bob needs to taste the coffee. That's the only way he will or will not know whether the coffee no, is sweetened or not. Or he could ask Alice. But he has to have some experience. She doesn't have to have any access to further experience to know that there is sugar in the coffee. Now, I'm happy to be told that there are skeptical scenarios, get your tricks, and so on. And suppose we take them on, on, on one side. The problem that I perceive is not yes or no experience. It's more what kind compared to Bob? I don't know whether that so takes care of a little bit of the... We'll get to that, okay. So, uh, this is somewhat related perhaps, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit dubious of your account of Alice because uh, for two reasons. One is all the research that we know about from neurology and psychology and stuff sort of says that your awareness, your consciousness of things you decide and anything you do, that happens later. So you, I mean, this isn't like a special case, it's just the normal thing that when you're going to do something, you, you become aware of it, uh, you know, afterwards. So it's true that she has a certain direct first person awareness that, you know, Bob, it's a bit more mediated, but still she, uh, by all normal accounts, you know, sort of becomes aware of the move, and, and there are all kinds of special examples where you just made a left there, you were supposed to make a right. And like, oh, I did make a left. You know, this, this is just, but that's sort of the normal thing. And then the other thing I was thinking, well, you, 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 you brought up Conan Doyle or God, well, I, I don't want to try to speak for God, but, but for uh, um, uh, authors, I can remember an interview with uh, J.K. Rowling where she was talking about how she had you know, realized that Dumbledore was gay. And presumably that is not something that she was thinking. This is something that to her, she sort of discovered, even though she did it, she may, you know. So I think you sort of have perhaps not unpacked the process of making enough. Mm -hmm. And if you did, it would, it would be that uh, Alice's uh, knowledge is, is much more akin to Bob's. 
Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. And um, um, I'm, I'm happy to do more unpacking if anyone was not already satisfied by the amount of unpacking I've done. Uh, I could see some places uh, being unpacked themselves, uh, like is there more unpacking? But yes, I mean, the, there's always more unpacking. These are no kind of Russian dolls. You can go on forever. Um, and I'm happy to keep going. But I think that um, uh, a clarification before you know, going down that road, which is an infinite road, uh, and that is that I'm not talking about psychology or cognitive science here in any possible way. These are three models. And actually, as a matter of fact, a scientist running an experiment is Alice, Bob, and Carol at the same time. That's the way I, I actually take it. So when I said, unfortunately, Alice and Bob, I mean, for the physicists among us, they're not real people. Mm. So, and neither is Carol. So please don't, don't get out of this room thinking, oh, he's talking about no, three guys and no, three, no, two, two ladies and a gentleman. No, I couldn't care less about human beings, honestly. These are three models. It could be three computers. They could be three you know, uh, logical, logically consistent agents, you name it. So please uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I agree with you that if we want to, no, I get this back home all the time. Wife neuroscientist, who is Alice? Who is Mozart? So, yes, we can do that. But the interest at the moment is to understand the logic behind rather than the sort of cognitive science that may or may not be uh, way more complex. Um, I'm completely with you that if we want to take that road, this has just scratched, you know, scratched the surface um, badly. So I'm ha happy to be told that way more needs to be done in that direction, but I'm trying to go in a slightly different. Well, in that case, I mean, all I'm saying is that uh, uh, Alice, the computer, uh, holds that piece of information in a database. And to be told that uh, that involves a lot of processing and so on, I'm happy to be told, but I, that's not the point. I mean, once she holds that piece of information, you know, as a computer holding that piece of information in the database, the acquisition of that piece of information is by making you know, the robot, say, move, making the move, as opposed to another robot seeing the move being made. I'm not sure that that requires much more unpacking on the sort of uh, algorithmic uh, uh, analysis that is required for the acquisition of information by observation and the acquisition of information by making things true. All I'm saying is suppose that that's the case. And someone may want to basically, I agree with you, may want to know way more about the story behind. Yes, it, it needs to be done. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I'm just trying to move forward, but there's much many more steps that need to be done you know, backwards to, to know the story. Yeah. why the message is, is not a mechanism to create common knowledge. Yeah, no. Yes, no, no, I think, I think it is, sorry. Don't, don't, um, if I said something that pointed it in the direction of saying that it doesn't, wrong. It does. And actually that's, that's prob um, I, mean, I don't want to conflate questions, but I think that precisely because it generates common knowledge, that it's, a, it's the first step towards an explanation of the you know, KK or II kind of uh, uh, axiom. So I think that it does, but it does in, in a way that basically is not interfering with the first step when before the, the, the announcement is uh, uh, broadcasted, and therefore not the generation of uh, common knowledge, what uh, Alice has in a say, database as a piece of information is such that the broadcast would not put that information there it would put, for example, information about the fact that now Bob and Carol know. Absolutely, yes. So um, um, on that, I, have no, I, I don't think there's any problem. Right. Thank you.